Just thinking, thinking forward, um, you know, how do, how do we think we should be enhancing the, the training of the next generation of psychiatrists? And, you know, we've talked about teaching them how to use clozapine, how to use long-acting injectables. What, what other areas do you think we need to help them focus on? I think that the, um, <clears throat> the next uh, sort of need or, or wave uh, is in um, models of mental health care that are population health focused. Um, the, the models that are being, you know, have historically been trained are all physician centric. And um, they're not uh, standardized in a uniform way, and they're also not uh, you know, uniformly represented and distributed geographically. And so you have this tremendous fragmentation and variation in the type and uh, quality of care. Everybody talks about access, but it's not just access, it's also quality. And um, we train psychiatrists in our residency programs to be able to provide treatment for different conditions and different modalities. But when they go out to jobs, that's not necessarily what they're going to do in the same level of emphasis. And in order to be able to provide population mental health, there's going to have to be more diversification with different paraprofessionals and team-based approaches. And those haven't been fully developed, and they're certainly not being uh, trained in, in, in graduate schools. Scott, what about technology? Do you think that's going to play a role in helping us to uh, improve disease management? Well, there's a lot of interest in mobile health technologies, and, and I think there's a potential role. Um, I think, you know, there are people who are using smartphones to remind people to take their meds. You know, we're trying to test a way to help uh, adjust uh, medication regimens optimally. You mentioned a way that uh, someone was using mobile technology at uh, Hillside. What was it? I can't remember what it was. So also monitoring, you know, monitoring speech, monitoring activity, oh, right. sleep. I mean, to know, predict could, relapse, to too, predict I, relapse, so people yeah. can figure yeah. out, you know, when, when someone needs an intervention. Yeah. Yeah. This, this idea, actually, this is a little bit related to what we were talking about a minute ago, but when you were bringing up ACT, I know there's, there's another way to sort of make sure people get clozapine or make, it, make sure they get shots is, you know, to have performance standards for, you know, clinics or ACT teams or coordinated specialty care teams to make sure that every team can prescribe clozapine or can give shots or, or whatever, you know, just in the same way we want them to deliver psychosocial programs. So I think that's... You know, sort of the regulatory thing might be one way to move it forward. You know, and, and the way you can make residency programs train people how to use clozapine or, or shots. Right. No, that's very important. So uh, this has been an extremely informative uh, discussion. And, you know, before we, before we end, I, I just want to make sure that uh, you have an opportunity to express any final thoughts about, about what we've been discussing. No, it's a, it's been a it's been a good opportunity to discuss what I think is an important treatment modality. I mean, I'm you know sort of honored to be here with these uh, people who really know the field well. So thanks for letting me participate. Thank you. Okay. Really honored to be here with these old altacacas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, uh, you know, despite the fact that you know mental health care is still. Uh, not adequately provided and uh, uh, impacting society in the way that it could, um, it's a very optimistic time because of the fact that it's not that we don't know, we don't have the knowledge to be able to provide care, it's just that we don't have the means to do it. And so w what that means is that uh, uh, we could really up our game substantially by doing what evidence is demonstrated, which is to be using treatments like clozapine, like LAIs more, by doing the kind of education of people up front so that's not viewed as like a penalty for having been non-compliant and bad uh, before, um, and by you know, optimizing the way in which the evidence-based treatments can be used best so that if you know, doctors have some you know, reticence uh, that a nurse is made available. Um, or that if there is some kind of ideological bias against the use in terms of trying to educate and orient um, clinical staff and uh, mental health care teams in a way. And so 
you know, I think there's a, a lot of um, ways in which the quality of care can be improved substantially without learning or discovering anything new through research, just taking the means that we have. So I feel that uh, that's really an optimistic thing. We just need to find the social, political, and professional will to, to, to find a way to do it. So we've, we've talked a lot about adherence and relapse and hospitalization, and I think we've said that we do have some, some very valuable options, some very powerful tools, but we need to really take advantage of them. We need to understand what the obstacles are. We need to make sure that people are trained, that we have the right systems in place, we have the right ancillary teams working together. But at the end of the day, even while we're waiting for further breakthroughs, you know, we can be doing a lot more to improve the lives of our patients if we can uh, bring some of these lessons to bear. So I want to thank you all for your contributions to this discussion. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope that you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative. Thanks very much.